Father, we thank you for your word, that it is rich, full, informative and profitable for teaching, direction, rebuke, that we may live godly lives. And as we think this morning about spiritual warfare, open our hearts and our minds, our lives, our imaginations to you and to your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A little bit of a different sort of sermon than I might normally preach. Um, and just to keep you cheered up, only nine points this morning. So, you know, nice and simple. But we're going to do a little bit of wandering as well. Um, we're going to be looking at Ephesians uh, 6, verses 10 to 20. And uh, we're going to start by reading those, please. Uh, en français, s'il vous plaît, Pascal. Enfin, mes frères et sœurs, fortifiez-vous dans le Seigneur et dans sa force toute puissante. Revêtez-vous de toutes les armes de Dieu afin de pouvoir tenir ferme contre les manœuvres du diable. En effet, ce n'est pas contre l'homme que nous avons à lutter, mais contre les puissances, contre les autorités, contre les souverains de ce monde de ténèbres, contre les esprits du mal dans les lieux célestes. C'est pourquoi prenez toutes les armes de Dieu afin de pouvoir résister dans le jour mauvais et tenir ferme après avoir tout surmonté. Tenez donc ferme, ayez autour de votre taille la vérité en guise de ceinture, en filet la cuirasse de la justice. Mettez comme chaussure à votre pied le zèle pour annoncer l'évangile de la de paix. Continuez s'il te plaît. Prenez en toutes circonstances le bouclier de la foi avec lequel vous pourrez éteindre toutes les flèches enflammées du mal. Faites aussi bon accueil au casque du salut et à l'épée de l'esprit, c'est-à-dire la parole de Dieu. Faites en tout temps par l'esprit toutes sortes de prières et de supplications. Veuillez à cela avec une entière persévérance et en priant pour tous les saints. Priez pour moi afin que lors j'ouvre la boucle, la bouche, la parole me soit donnée pour faire connaître avec assurance le mystère de l'Évangile. C'est pour lui que je suis ambassadeur dans les chaînes. Priez que j'en parle avec assurance comme je dois le faire. We can go back and have that in English, please. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, 
that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Thank you. Thank you both of you. I am um, reminded that some months back now, Derek took us through the book of Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls of uh, Jerusalem. And part of what he spoke about was the opposition that Nehemiah and, uh, and his companions uh, faced and endured as they were rebuilding the walls. And some of it was from within, and some of it was from without. And very much spiritual warfare we're going to discover can be from within and without. Um, I'm also reminded as I come into this subject of the book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews, we have a great outlining of where the victory comes through the cross of Jesus, through the blood. Other letters do as well, but there's a lot in there about our <coughs> salvation. Uh, and we sang it, didn't we? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. And that's the heart of the victory. Revelation speaks of the second coming and at Jesus' return when that kingdom, as we've just prayed, will be complete and be made perfect. I'm also aware, next screen, um, of, say, of, of, of Peter's warning. Uh, in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9. You're going to see quite a bit of yellow highlight. I'm going to leave you to do some reading, but focus particularly on the yellow highlights. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith. Which rings bells with what Paul writes in Ephesians. And there we have my lovely little lion. Isn't he sweet? Or she? But seeing a lion like that reminds me of an event many, many years ago at Southport Zoo. It was a rainy, damp day, and I was there with my little daughter, who was probably three or four. And she had a red cagoule on. And as we walked down one of the um, streets, there in the distance is the lion in its cage and suddenly, and down went the ears and it's thinking, oh, they're bringing my meat in a different format today. It does look tasty. That sticks in my mind every time I look at this verse. Satan is waiting to pounce, ready to pounce and is not a sweet uh, little Lion. I've got to remember which way to swipe my page. He is there and he's waiting. And there are some rules, but not very many. He will go wherever he can, however he can. From within, that's the fellowship, from without. From within ourselves, from without. It can come in all shapes and sizes. Firstly, then in Ephesians 6, <clears throat> 10, to 20, 10 to 20, sorry I put the reference wrong in French, I've only just noticed, uh, that was a little slip, but don't ask me how. Following on from Peter, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The battle we're involved in is not one we fight. It's a battle that Jesus fought on the cross. It's a battle that will be consummated when Jesus returns. And he fills us with his Holy Spirit to equip and enable us in the battle that we are called to. The temptations, the things that are thrown at us, the things that go wrong. And I'm well aware that in this church, lots of us are facing an coming up against problems and difficulties, things that can be attacks. We've issues perhaps in our own lives. We've issues in the lives of our families. 
We've got things coming in at us from different directions. All there to knock us. Even if it's only a hum in the speaker and getting it right just before we're starting. Satan uses these things to throw our confidence and our focus. And our focus. Secondly, put on the armour of God and stand. Verse 11 and the first part of verse 13. And the emphasis there is very much on standing. Paul uses that word a number of times. At one level we are not called, we are not called to attack Satan. He attacks us, we are called to stand. Jesus has defeated Satan on the cross. Completely and utterly. And he stands defeated. But because he's a deceiver, he's also deceived. And because he's proud, he thinks he can still win. But of course he can't because he's nailed. And he was nailed when Jesus died on the cross. And if you've seen Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ, very vividly portrayed uh, cinematographically uh, the defeat of Satan. And he stands defeated. Paul in Colossians talks about him and all the forces of evil being in the victory parade, paraded off as defeated, as spoils of war. But that in one sense is still yet to come. And we now have to stand with the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, 13, you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, stand, stand firm. It's just stand, 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 stand. Verse 12, a very difficult verse, and Paul uses these phrases more than once. Uh, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Then he goes on, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is the enemy without and within. A physical enemy at one level can, can be flesh and blood, some of it, but a spiritual enemy. It can be the In his days, the powers of the Roman Empire. Today, it could be the powers of... You fill it in, I'll leave you. Uh, All sorts of them. But it also can be the spiritual powers of darkness in the heavenly realms. Unseen, unknown. Manipulating the earthly powers. Because often behind these atrocious wars, there's a spiritual battle as well that's been manipulated and the strings are being pulled by powers of darkness and of evil. And some of the people who are doing these awful wars are playing around with occult and heavy occult stuff. So you know, it permeates in all sorts of different ways. Oh, what happened then? Oh, I stretched the screen, that's all right. Paul's in prison. He's got a guard in front of him. He'd be a soldier. And his thoughts go to the battlefield. What do so- that's where soldiers belong. And he's thinking, what does this guy wear on the battlefield for protection? For moving forward, slowly but surely. And he lists, therefore, 13 onwards, the full armour of God. Starting technically in verse 14, there's the belt of truth. I've got a belt on, it's holding my trousers up. This soldier would have a belt on that would probably hold all his armour around his body together. Truth. And truth is important. Jesus had a conversation with Pilate. What is truth? You know, the question is there. Jesus is truth. His word is truth. And if we're going to be Held together, we need the word of God. And I'm going to say it again. You've got to read it. Learn, mark and inwardly digest. To quote the old Church of England colleague which is still prayed. 
read, learn, mark, and inwardly digest. Feeding on Jesus is what we were thinking of uh, in John 6. Taking him on board, but taking his word on board, because he's the word become flesh. So we're digesting it as a whole. But it's got to be there at the root and the foundation of all that we are and all that we would be. Second half of verse 14. The helmet of salvation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Breastplate of righteousness. I've written it down uh, wrong. The breastplate of righteousness. Your heart. Those delicate emotions. A place of all sorts of incredible things. And that needs protecting. Protecting with salvation. What Jesus did on the cross. And it's a gift. The gift of, the, of salvation to protect the heart that is so delicate, that feels pain and sadness. Uh, I know that in Hebrew and Greek, or Hebrew and biblical thought, some emotions are seated further down, those gut feelings. Well, perhaps the breastplate of righteousness covers those as well. Uh, protected, a gift because of salvation. Verse 50, and I remember, oh yes, and righteousness, not because we're goody goody two shoes. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, 4 to 10, it's God's righteousness. He says, as a Pharisee, I had my own righteousness. I was good. I kept all the law, this, that, and the other. I was top of the class all the way. But it was all rubbish because I now have the gift of a righteousness that comes through Jesus, through his cross, through his life, through his self-giving. A righteousness that's imparted and we're becoming Christ-like in that righteousness. The shoes. Shoes are important. I've got my desert wellies on today. Um, and now and again, going up the steps, I catch my foot. Um, you've got to have the right shoes. You don't go on the stage to do ballet with a pair of football boots on. Well, you could do, but it might be a bit clompy, mightn't it? And a soldier needs shoes that are good to move forward. Move forward. And it's the gospel of peace, the gospel of reconciliation, the gospel of hope, the gospel of life that keeps us moving. And we need to keep our eyes on the good news of Jesus, the fullness of the good news of Jesus. From birth, his deity, his teaching, his signs, his wonders, his death, his resurrection, his pouring out of the spirit and his coming again. To be shared free, freely, frequently, maybe fervently. Let's have three F's with people as we can, as God gives opportunity. Then there's the helmet. Your head is very, very susceptible, as I found out when I came off my bike a few weeks ago. Or worse still, a few years ago, uh, when I was out for about an hour uh, in a different cuckoo land. Um, Head, all right, I know I'm always in a cuckoo land, thank you. But you know, very, very delicate. Easy to take heavy, nasty blows. And again, some of the weaponry on foot soldiers and nasty things, it's particularly before they had guns. You know, things that they would spike into the head and all the rest of it. You need good protection. And it's our salvation. That is where we're protected. What does salvation do? It guarantees life. And whatever's being thrown at us, where it's being thrown, the most delicate place as the sort of source of life after our hearts, we are protected with the salvation, that gift of God. We can't earn salvation as we can't earn righteousness. It's a gift. It's part of the equipment that God gives to us in his love and in his care. And I put them the wrong way around. The shield of faith. First half of verse 16. Shield, very important. And it moves into place. So you know if there's a, an arrow coming that way, there. If it's coming that way, there. 
And of course, in the Roman soldiers, the shield was a big thing and they made those tortoises so they could actually move as a whole team. And we are a whole team as a church family, move together, some shields at the top, some at the sides, some at the front and some at the back, and no doubt with somebody with a little peephole to see where they were going so they didn't trip up. But the shield is important. The big shield, and then sometimes there's a little shield, certainly in medieval, uh, that was very manoeuvrable to protect against the sword. And in this case, Paul is mentioning flaming arrows, flaming darts that Satan wants to throw at us to damage. And being on fire, and Hollywood late likes to make a huge deal of flaming arrows flying, don't they? But they do a lot of damage because they burn. They burn. And the shield, of course, was soaked in water beforehand, so it would put them out, extinguish them. He didn't go with a dry shield, otherwise you'd just be on fire. He used to soak them in water, I am told. Whoops, scroll the wrong way. The shield of faith. The helmet of salvation. Sorry, I did put those the wrong way around. And the sword of the spirit, the word of God. A sword is defense. And it's attack. And we need it primarily for defense. And again, we're back to knowing the word of God. Isn't it what Jesus did when he was tempted? Turn these stones into bread. No, man shall not live by bread alone. Do not tempt the Lord your God. And he's, he's quoting scripture. And Satan misquotes scripture. He says, jump off the top. There's a psalm that says he'll catch you and stop you from falling. And, and, and Jesus just quotes back and says, don't tempt the Lord your God. So remember... Satan can misquote scripture and use it to his own ends. We use it to defend. We also perhaps are going to use it to move forward as well. Proclaiming that word. So that the powers of darkness are being defeated. So that people are being brought to faith. Again in accompaniment with the shoes of the gospel of peace. The sword of the spirit. And then fifthly. Because we've had following on from Peter. Uh, the whole aspect of standing, the enemy within and without, the armour of God. And fifthly, I put it separately, prayer in the spirit, verse 18. Regular, varied, praying for all God's people, praying. And sometimes, maybe even without words, move a screen on, Romans 8, 26, 27, he helps us. Sometimes it's just a sigh. I don't know what, Lord. I don't know. Your will be done. Maybe praying in tongues. That God-given language, if we've got that gift. And in spiritual warfare, praying in tongues can be quite significant. When we're very aware and acutely aware of the presence of evil. To be able to pray in tongues on that occasion, as many will have found is a great weapon of support and defence and strengthening. Prayer in the spirit. Spiritual prayer. But it's got to be regular. As I keep pumping that we should read the Bible, we should do it in prayer. And our Bible reading should guide some of our prayer and our praying as we go along. So God equips us but I want to jump back a thousand years. I want to go. Next screen. I've got to remember which way to swipe. Where do I want to go? David and Goliath. Because sometimes the enemy seems so big and intimidating and frightening. And so daunting. And we feel so small and inadequate. But David... Is a good and exciting story. We're not going to read it all. We, have, we can't read even any of it. But again, follow the little bits of verses I'm going to be putting before us. Because I'm putting this under the heading of an interesting battle. And it's 1 Kings 17. If you've never read it, read it. And if you haven't read it recently, read it again. 
It's an exciting story, uh, an account actually. And David is pitted against this, well no, Goliath said he's huge, he's cursing and blaspheming the Philistine army, and he's saying, send out your best warrior, and whoever wins, winner takes all. You'll be our slaves or you'll be our slaves, whichever way around. And of course, all the armies there quaking in their boots because of this great big strapping man whose um, spear is as thick as a man's wrist. And that's a fighting man's wrist, probably not mine. He's a big chunky guy. Frightening. He's a lean, mean, fighting machine. And they're all quaking in their boots. David is sent from looking after his sheep with some nourishment for his brothers who are all there on the battlefield. And there's a fascinating exchange. What are you doing here? Go and look after your silly sheep. But he also looks and sees what's going on. And he says, you know, you're a load of yellow bellies. What's there to be frightened of? I'll go and fight him. To which Saul says, in highlight there, you are only a young man. And he's been a warrior all his life. And his reply? Well, I'm out there looking after these silly little sheep, as they call it. But I get bears and lions. Do you think they bother me? Do you think this guy's going to bother me? No. He has defied, verse 36, the armies of the living God. So he's bringing it into a spiritual battle himself. This isn't just about. And the guy's blaspheming and all sorts of things, calling down curses in the name of his gods. You have to read all of that. And so this sort of, oh my Lord. And there it is. The, the, the Lord who rescued me, 37, will rescue me. He's putting his trust totally and utterly in the Lord. So Saul says, all right, you can go out, but you'll have to put my armour on. So they put it on and he's, he's like that. Because Saul, as we're told elsewhere, is head and shoulders above everybody else. So it's totally unfitting. And David says, like, I can't go out in this, I can't even move. And he gets his stones and his sling. And he becomes light and, I'm trying to think of the right adjectives, and nimble. And able to manoeuvre where there's this great big gollocking giant of a guy. And there's a lot of cur more cursing and nasty stuff to David. Absolutely despicable words thrown at David. And he just says, you have come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Which is a bit like what you were saying before. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And when we see in the, name, uh, in, in the New Testament, Jesus dealing with evil spirits and sickness, and he says on one occasion, if it's by the finger of God that I deliver, set people free, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. The authority, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. And then he boldly declares, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he'll give all of you into our hands. And although he took five stones, it took one stone to floor the man and kill him. And to make sure he was dead, he removed his head. And the victory was mighty. The victory was mighty. We are not contending against flesh and blood. We are against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Next screen, Job. I was brought all over the place to look at this. Job chapter 1, again. Who's there in the heavenly court? Satan. He's been roaming around, looking for someone, and he points out Job, or God points out Job. So, he's raw, roaming like a lion, verse 7. He's also authorised, oh, this is difficult, isn't it? 
Have you considered my servant Job? But he's also limited. And that happens, is repeated later on in chapter 2. And limited. On the man himself, do not lay a finger. So there's a limit to what Satan can do set by God. But there's also a way out or a way through. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He will not let you be tempted, tested. You can, I think, interchange the word. Beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. And I think it can also be translated a way through. Because God doesn't take us out of problems. He enables us. Hence the whole armour of God. To be able to move through and to stand and to withstand and be progressing with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, it can be tough and hard. And I was brought to mind when we're weary, we need rest and balance. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It was quoted, I think, by Derek again a few weeks back, if I remember rightly. Um, Come to me when you're weary. When you're battle worn. And I will, I think rest isn't the best word. I like the word refreshment. I will refresh you. What were we doing earlier this week? Regularly with lots of water because we were weary with the heat, not of battle, but just the heat of the sunshine. We needed refreshment. Jesus gives us refreshment and renewal and strength. To continue, not to stop, but to continue. And sometimes we have to go backwards a bit and take time out to go back in refreshed and renewed. That's why we call our time away holiday, holy days, a chance to be refreshed and renewed. But Jesus talks about burdens and yokes, and it says yoke is well fitting, it's what an animal would wear, what people wear to carry water, it's well fitting it's comfortable, it won't chase, and my burden actually is not light, it's well balanced imagine if you've got a yoke on, you've got a bucket full of whatever on one side and nothing in the other you're going to be walking like that but this is what we sometimes do in life, we've got burdens on us that we need to give to Jesus because they're crippling us And we need what he's got because it's well balanced. And I think the picture goes for the line on a ship, the plimsoll line. That's to make sure the ship is well balanced. It's a similar thought and a similar picture. We need to be well balanced. And the gospel, the good news, his love, his salvation, all that we stand for, all our worship and the rest, helps us to keep in balance to keep away from the things that would put us out of balance or try to sink us. You know, if you put all the weight on the boat at one end, it goes the wrong way or that way, depends where you put it. And they put ballast, of course, to keep the balance, to make it even. And Jesus gives us the right things to live a good and balanced life. Receive from him. We are in a battle But we need him and he's at the centre of it all. Remember (coughs) Hebrews Revelation. He's at the centre of it all. But finally, last but not least. Whoops. Wrong way on there. Hebrews 12 came to my mind. Run with perseverance. The race that's set before us. Get rid of all the sin. Verse 1. Um that entangles and hinders. So again, it's a bit of a parallel uh, to what we just looked at in Matthew 11. Get rid of the junk. Keep your eyes firmly on Jesus, who he is, all those lovely things we thought earlier. Fixed on him. He's the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And Jesus endured the cross. He suffered. He had all that Satan could throw at him. Literally. Because he threw all my sins at Jesus. He threw all of your sins and all the sin of the world. 
Our iniquity, Isaiah 53, was laid on him. And it is by his stripes that we are healed. It was all thrown on Jesus. He endured it from sinners. He endured it from sinners. So you will not grow weary. But it was also from Satan. Satan was there, attack. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he comes down from the cross, we'll believe him. That was temptation. That was Jesus being pushed and pushed and pushed. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And the main reason we've looked at what I've looked this morning is to encourage us. To encourage us in the battles we face, from without and within, from the fears, the anxieties. And I needed to hear this because I preached this ser a sermon on this, the armour of God, March last year. But I needed to be reminded of these words again. And maybe you needed to be reminded of them. To be encouraged, to be strengthened and to keep our eyes solely on Jesus. In prayer. In spiritual <coughs> prayer. Reminding ourselves that we have the armour of God. It is his gift to us. So that we can stand and having done all to stand. Be encouraged today. Be strengthened. Be renewed and seek the Lord and his spirit and all he wants to bring to you. And think a little, David, and read that again. And have a smile along the line as you see him staggering in Saul's armour. And remember that he just goes nimbly in the name of the Lord. Because the enemy is never too big. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these scriptures that we look at this morning. Thank you for the armour that you give us, that you equip us with, that you provide us with, your armoury, not ours. And Father, for each one of us, just be with us, bless us, care for us. You know what hurts us. Maybe thoughts in our heads, in our feelings in our lives. Things that have distressed us, stressed us, caused us pain and anxiety. We come to Jesus for rest. We come to Jesus and keep our eyes on him, remembering that we need to deal with sin by confessing it and bringing it to the cross so that our faith may be strengthened that we may be encouraged and renewed and refreshed. In the precious name of Jesus and in the anointing power of the Spirit we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, if I might just say a few things before we, we move on, which I believe ties in with what Steve has just preached, uh, some verses that uh, God gave.